Okay, let's get started. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody who's on this town hall. We appreciate all the feedback we get. So ahead of time, thank you for any feedback that you're going to provide. Um, second, I know it's a Monday morning and um, it's you know beginning of the week. So uh, this will also be recorded. So if you know people who can't be here for whatever reason, it's being recorded. So please let them know that that is also a possibility um, for watching it in the future. Um, I want to thank Jenny for once again being our moderator. And uh, it will be the normal format for the first half of this town hall. We want to give you all a few updates, um, talk about some issues that have come up, see if you have questions. And then for the second part, we really are starting to look for feedback on FNA indirect rates, and then also just moving research and creative activity forward at Idaho State. So the first half will be much more of the traditional town hall that we've all been experiencing this last year. The second half will be more interactive. Uh, Ginny for the first half is gonna take questions in chat, just like always, she has posted that already. So we'll take questions in chat. For the second half, we're going to let you all unmute when you have comments. And I think the way we're gonna do this, we'll see how it works, is put your name in the chat and then we can just call on you and make sure that we get people um, so that I don't miss anyone as we're going through. So general overview of what we wanna talk about over the next hour. First of all, a couple updates. Second, um, just a little bit of an overview of letting you all know that we recognize COVID has created havoc on a lot of people. And that has of course bled into research and creative activities. So a little bit of a um, overview of that. And then also um, starting with the general discussion about how we can move research and creative activities forward at ISU. So I want to start with a couple updates. I have one from the FBI and then I'm going to turn it over to Deb. Um, just as a uh, note for all of you, the FBI has sent out a couple emails in the last week or so talking about the fact that there is an increase in ransomware activity and they are definitely targeting institutions of higher education and in particular research and creative activity types of emails. So everybody's aware, we've all gone through the training online, but just be particularly aware that ransomware is out there in force right now for some reason, and just pay attention to that and maintain your vigilance. Deb. Thanks, Donna. Um, I'm Deb Easterly. I'm Assistant Vice President for Research in charge of research compliance. I don't recognize some of the names on there, on the call, so I thought I'd introduce myself. I just wanted to pass on a few things that you might be noticing with my name on it, um, a little bit more to do with research compliance, things that have been in force, but we're trying to uh, um, make people aware of them and to, to get back and make sure we're doing things correctly. So if you have submitted a proposal in the last week or so, you will have gotten from me a Qualtrics survey that you need to answer. It's on undue foreign influence. Um, the feds are wanting universities to be more aware of foreign influence that might be against or, or with the universities. And so it's just six simple questions. When you submit, submit a proposal, you'll just need to answer those. Um, if you submit five proposals in one day, you'll get five separate surveys from me. So just you need to fill in the, the proposal number and, and answer the questions. Conflict of interest is another thing that's been around for, with us for a long time, especially what I'm concerned about is the significant financial conflict of interest. And NSF and NIH have always had more of an emphasis on declaring conflicts of interests. So if you are going to be applying to NSF or NIH, you'll get another survey from me with a few more detailed conflict of interest questions. The third area I want to remind everyone of is responsible conduct of research training. And we have that available for any students or any faculty who want to take it. But if you are paying a student from an NSF grant, they have to take the RCR training. At ISU, we have it set up at a minimum 
of what's required, but that is to take training on the city program. So when I see that you get an NSF award and you have students that you're paying, you'll get another email from me and uh, reminding you, giving you that information. Finally, I want to remind everyone that the Undergraduate Research Symposium is April 8th, two o'clock to four o'clock. Um, we'll be doing it a little different this year since we'll be not in person. Um, from two to three, we have a couple of speakers about research and, and things that are, would be of interest to students. And then three to four, we'll have some undergraduate research students present their posters. Um, depending on how many we get, we may not be able to move everyone in there, but we do have a new mod or uh, system that we're using called Forager One Symposium. And you'll be seeing posters and, and things and news and notes about it of the link that you can go and look at the posters. Um, there'll be ways that you can interact with students. Students can have a poster, but they can also do a short video presentation. So um, please, if you don't see that information around in the next week, give me a, an email and I'll make sure you have all those links. Thank you. So Deb's introduction reminded me that I skipped introductions. So my name is Donna Leibecker. I think I know most of the names here, but I also want to introduce the rest of the Office for Research who is here. So Dave Rogers will be speaking momentarily. Dave Harris. Uh, Fred Parrish, and then, of course, Deb, who you have already heard from. So we're the people that if you have issues, questions, concerns, please contact one or multiple of us because we um, are all about trying to figure out how to address the questions that are being presented. So the next thing we want to talk about is just give a brief overview of the fact that we very much recognize COVID has become a major deterrent for a lot of the research and creative activity that normally goes on within a year. We recognize it. We are hoping to be able to look at some of the issues. Um, and Dave Rogers has more information on that. Thanks, Donna. Um, earlier this semester, I served on a faculty committee that was convened at the uh, behest of the Academic Affairs Office. And that committee created a survey uh, for faculty uh, that looked at the impacts of COVID on teaching and research and service. Um, the response to that survey was outstanding. I think we had more than 400 faculty respond, uh, providing their input. Um, the uh, report for that uh, uh, survey has been compiled by the committee and is on its way to the provost's office. I can just share a little bit, sort of an overview, if you will, of the research component. Um, really no surprises. What we found is that uh, uh, nearly all uh, faculty who were conducting research felt that their research had been negatively impacted by um, the uh, COVID pandemic and, and the response that we had to do. Of course, the main reason for that was because everyone had to um, change the way in which they delivered their courses. And uh, they ran out of time to do everything in their job. And so um, what got put uh, at a lower priority was the amount of time and effort that they were able to do um, research. Um, in addition, there were a lot of other uh, negative impacts uh, or uh, consequences. Uh, a lot of people had difficulty uh, getting access, uh, whether that access was in a field setting or a laboratory setting, or especially for all of you who uh, do human subjects type research um, or performances, um, all of these things, of course, uh, were minimized or, or completely canceled. Um, there are other, other things. Some of you had trouble getting lab supplies. Um, some of you have found that um, your publications uh, that you've submitted or your, your articles you've submitted for review, um, the uh, reviews are taking longer, uh, proposals are taking perhaps longer to be reviewed. This is happening nationwide. I think what we're most interested in is uh, hearing um, how we can come out of this in, in 2021. Um, so if you have any questions on, say, Office of Research um, 
assistance that we can provide uh, as we come out of this. Uh, you can ask that later on in the uh, Q&A part of this uh, presentation. Thanks, Dave. All right, the last piece of information before we open it up to comments from all of you is that we want to just give a general air overview of where we are today. So in order to move research and creative activity forward at Idaho State, the Office of Research believes we really need to address two distinct things. Well, they're not distinct, actually, they're very intertwined. Two things that are intertwined. The first one is looking at the FNA rates and caveat to this, this is tied up in the renegotiation process that Idaho State is, is doing with the federal government at the moment. So we're working on a space survey, we're working with the feds to renegotiate these rates. So we don't have the ultimate uh, endpoint for that negotiation yet. So we're still in somewhat of a holding pattern for, for knowing exactly where we're going to land there. So that's something that we're looking at. The uh, finance actually is looking at the space survey and whatnot. And we want to, once we have those rates, get ideas and thoughts from all of you as to, you know, is this a good way to distribute the rates? Should we readjust them? What do we need to do with that? Keeping in mind, of course, that if we take money out of one pool to put it into another one, something's going to be shorted. So just looking big picture, we want feedback on all of you for FNA rates and directs, um, whatever you want to call those. The second piece is this idea of moving things forward at ISU for research and creative activity. We know that there have been obstacles. COVID is one of the huge ones, but even before COVID, there were certain obstacles that created problems with moving research and creative activities forward. So we want to identify what those are and then also identify what are some things that would incentivize all of you to move forward with your research and creative activity. So we really are open to any ideas. We're trying to compile a massive list and then start figuring out what we can address. So this is step one in a, in a process. Um, I'm going to let Fred give a little bit of an overview of where we are, what our current FNA distribution looks like, and then we'll open it up to thoughts, ideas um, that you all have. Fred. Thank you, Donna. Okay, so Donna has just asked me to describe the current uh, distribution of returned uh, FNA, and the standard <clears throat> distribution is as follows. 5% goes to the library. 35% comes to the office for research. 30% goes to finance, central finance, the lion's share of which is actually used to support uh, grants and contracts accounting. And then the remaining 30% goes is returned to the originating unit, at which point the paths diverge really quickly. Um, different units, different colleges or divisions have a different approach to how they share or don't share that 30% with uh, individual departments and or uh, PIs. So that's the, the broad stroke uh, explanation of how FNAs are distributed. I suspect you all will have questions about that that I will leave to this next period here, the question answer. I'm not going anywhere, I'll be on the Zoom here. So uh, any other questions you have about that, we'll be happy to answer if we can. All right, I'm going to see if we have any questions before we move into just opening it up to all of you for thoughts or ideas. Hey Donna, hi everyone, good morning. I wanna apologize for my audio um, this morning, having some technical difficulties, but it's Monday and we're gonna follow through. <laughs> so I don't have any questions so far in the chat. Um, so Donna, if you wanna open it up for uh, open discussion, I think people can feel free to unmute themselves um, and ask any questions or or make any comments or open up an idea for discussion. Perfect. So just a reminder, we're looking for ideas on two things, but 
they're broad, so any thoughts that you all have. The first one is F&A distribution, so how that money is divided up. And then the second one is moving research and creative activities forward. So what we can do to tackle some of the obstacles that you encounter and or any thoughts on incentives that would help you be more incentivized to move research and creative activities forward. Additionally, don't feel like you have to come up with all your brilliant ideas right now. We are taking comments at the Office for Research email address, which is or at isu.edu. And if you want to just type us an email and give us comments, that's also perfect. Um, we want to make sure everybody has time to think about this. If you know others who can't be on this call and who have thoughts, give them that address. Um, it was in the email that we originally sent out. I'll also do a follow up with that. But all right, Josh, I see your hand up. Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry I'm eating lunch at the same time, so uh, please forgive me if I'm sloping. Um, one of the question I have is, uh, <clears throat> unlike other universities, our uh, teaching is very restrictive uh, to fall and spring semester only. And I was wondering if there's a way at a higher level that university opens up uh, a faculty teaching load to be spread out over the entire 12 months um, period where people might be able to concentrate their time in spring or, you know, uh, fall semesters. Right now, a bulk of our research has to be done during the summer. And that is a, a huge, um, I guess, challenge for many people who have to go out to the field or collaborate with other people and travel extended period of time. I've got to also think that anyone who's a parent and has kids home during the summer also has an added issue with, you know, just traveling and doing research. So I think that's a great point, Josh. Of course, Office for Research does not set teaching agendas. So this is very much a academic affairs provost slash dean's question, but I will certainly put it forward to all of them and note that it does impact research. There's so much overlap between teaching and research that this is an issue that I would like Office for Research to be a part of the discussion, and we can certainly make your point um, in that discussion. Additionally, just as an FYI to everyone, I know that the bigger picture of ISU is looking at what do we need to do to move forward out of this COVID situation. Higher ed obviously has been very much shifted since we have so much online, since budgets are you know, hit at many state levels, even at the federal government level. So I know that higher ed is in this process of transition and there are a number of committees in ISU administration that's looking at that. So I think Josh, that that's a really great point, not just for academic affairs, but also I can bring it forward to some of those other groups and just put it out there as an idea of how we can move ISU forward. So thank you for that. If I could add, Donna, uh, there is precedence for that in the College of Science and Engineering. Uh, over the past 20 years, we've, of course, had many deans. Some deans have uh, uh, allowed that. I can think of examples in mathematics. Uh, of course, they have to teach a lot of summer school classes. And uh, I can think of a couple faculty members through the years whose appointments uh, included um, full teaching loads in the summer um, as opposed to, say, a fall or a spring. So I think it's something that uh, chairs and maybe individuals work out uh, with their dean. So, and Donna, oh, yeah. excuse me, Donna, I was just gonna say we have um, a question in the queue as well. Can you share the breakdown of the 35% of FNA allotted to the Office of Research? I can, Jared, that's a question I was ready for. So thanks for asking it. Um, so the biggest portion of that goes toward uh, internal grants. We so I'll, I'll I'll go so far as to put numbers on this. For next year, we're anticipating about eight hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. It's a guess, of course, how much we're actually going to recover 
but we anticipate about eight hundred twenty-five thousand dollars in you know that thirty-five percent that comes back to us. Two hundred and fifty thousand we set aside for internal grants, um, and then another twenty-five thousand for research support. So that's two hundred seventy-five thousand that we return back or not research, research travel support, excuse me. So that's 275,000 that we have budgeted to return back via those two devices, you know, to directly support research in that way. Uh, another couple hundred thousand goes towards supporting our core facilities and labs, the animal facility, the molecular research core, some other labs that fall within our purview who we give support to. Um, 120,000 is budgeted to go toward research development and office or sponsored projects support. Most of that is for Cayuse. Uh, that program offers us a lot of uh, capability. It's very good, but it's also very expensive, unfortunately. Um, so a big chunk goes toward that. Uh, and then a number of other activities the compliance operation, research integrity and compliance, Deb leads is 50,000, uh, 25,000 for patents and intellectual property uh, maintenance and support. The Office of Research provides that. Um, we have 75,000 for what I'm calling grant development support. So that includes uh, most of that, half, more than half of that is for support of the EPSCOR grant. Um, we contract with a, a grant consulting group um, to do that, um, the implementation group. So that takes a chunk of that. And then some other uh, entities that we contract with for um, consulting, I guess, for lack of a better term. So that's about 75,000. And then the rest um, is essentially what I call ad hoc research support which is what you all that's calling Donna and asking her for money. <laughs> the informal description of that is, Hey, Donna, I need this. Um, so there's, you know, a chunk there for, for that as well. Now, keep in mind, as I went through those budget numbers, office research also has appropriated funds that we use. So that is not, you know, sort of a summation of the office research's budget in total, because we support a bunch of other activities through different funds. But in terms of the FNA return, that's how that breaks down. And just one little addition to that, the XScore grant, for anyone who is not, um, uh, not in the know as to what that is, it's a grant that is between Boise State, U of I, and ISU. So the contractors that we work with is, is a group that works with all of the universities. So it's not just ISU that pays for that one. Um, Lori has a question. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, most people don't know me, I'm fairly new to ISU. I'm uh, the program director for Homeland Security and Emergency Management which is housed within the emergency services department. So I'm sorry, I'm on a learning curve, which might be part of why I have this question. Uh, about the f &A disbursement, um, I was taking a look at the 30% that would flow back to the originating unit. And for our programs, our academic programs in emergency services were clinical, faculty, very, very few ISU permanent faculty members. We use a lot of adjunct faculty to instruct in our programs. And I was just a little bit concerned that if we were, I anticipate there being a fair amount of grants being generated uh, related to COVID from emergency management and emergency um, logistics support that could be coming from the Department of Homeland Security that we would have some excellent um, knowledgeable adjunct faculty who could work on some of those. But I don't know the logistics of that or if there would be enough uh, resources, financial resources to be able to compensate them if they were doing that work. So that was my question. Okay, so there's a few questions in there. One 
is can you pay these adjuncts? And part of that then is going to go back to how their grants are structured, right? I mean, if you've written them in as a direct expense into the grants, whatever, that's, you know, so you're going to, if you do that, then it's mo irrelevant to the conversation here. And that would be preferable, right? Anytime you can write something in as a direct charge to the grant, you know, that's where you want to go if possible. Okay, then what you're more likely asking is how much of the indirects that those grants generate are going to be available to your department in order to provide other uh, funds that you can't direct right into the grant. So, as I said, that varies depending on the unit that you're in. So, um, are you in the College of Technology? What unit are you in, Lori? Uh, we're, we're part of Health Sciences, uh, Emergency okay. Services. So, I'll give you two answers to this question. The one answer is you need to talk to your business office in the Division of, of Health Sciences. They can describe to you how the the 30% that is returned to the division is distributed within the division. Um, now, I will also say that I, I can look that up for you on a specific grant. If you wanna know how are the indirects returned on a specific grant, I can look that up for you, um, but I won't be able to tell you anything beyond, okay, here's the percentages. Um, and I'm, I'm willing to do that. So if you, if you want to reach out to me, and that goes for anybody. If you're curious how the, you know, what your 30%, you know, who's your originating unit that's getting that 30%, um, I can look that up for you. But anything beyond that in terms of the management of it or negotiating, you know, there might be some provision in your college to negotiate with the college for some larger share of those indirects to be returned to you, that, that's handled administratively by management of the units. This is a follow-up question um, on Lori and Fred's conversation. Are those emergency services grant, grants at the proposal stage or in existence already? I think that there are um, existing grants that would probably be one potential research uh, venue, but I, I anticipate some new grants uh, being generated in the new fiscal years uh, because of the challenges we've seen with deployments of um, vaccines throughout the country. So that question made me think of something that I want feedback from all of you on if, if there's any thoughts. And that is, I know one of the things that would strengthen research and creative activities at ISU is if people had a really good feel for who else was working on the similar types of issues. So that's a really hard thing to do. But if any of you have great ideas of how we can help create that synergy, by all means, let us know. Um, we're working on redoing the web page. And that you know can certainly be a part of that process, but if you have any other thoughts, we are open to anything like that. Okay, and we have another question for Fred. Um, the question is if Fred could recap the internal grants and travel portions of your discussion, and then a suggestion that um, you could write something up later and share it. Uh, recap. Uh, we give about two. We'll give about two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars this next year. We'll spend about two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars on internal grants and then the research travel support. That's two hundred fifty thousand for the internal grants, and then the twenty-five thousand for research travel support. We actually give that to the colleges, who then award that. We used to manage that directly through the office of research. Um, but we determined that it's a lot better if we award that to the colleges. So next year, and all you know, transparency, we, we didn't award that this year. There's no very little travel happening uh, right now. Uh, and so we just kind of 
call us evil, but we just took the prerogative and just say nobody's traveling. We're not giving that, but we have it in the budget for next year to award that twenty five thousand dollars. I know, Dave, I'll let you chime in on this if you want. Um, we do have really uh, accurate uh, reporting on how those internal grants have been distributed in the past, you know, by college and so on and so forth that we can provide, you know, as directed by Donna or Dave's discretion. Yeah, Fred, thanks. We, we have it broken down by college, um, by year, by grant program. Um, however, you really, however you want to see it. I mean, it's just, it's not at the individual grant award stage, but by year, by college, by grant program. Um, if, if, I mean, just Jenny, if, if I could share for just a second, I can, I could pop up a, a table to, to show you real quickly. Um, And as you, as you can see, here's a table real quickly that shows uh, by the different programs, uh, you'll note that developing collaborations was in there for a while. And then now that that went away, that program went away and it was replaced by the internal small grant program. Um, but since fiscal 2014, we've awarded 1.5 million in internal awards. And you can see the breakdown of the, you know, for each college and you know, college or unit. I should say. So again, you know, at, at Donna's discretion, we can share this however we need to. And, and, um, uh, and it's, it's available. Also, if you have any questions, you can always just ask and we're more than happy to show you where, where your college sits or where, you know, the university sits. Yeah. Again, we're trying to figure out the best ways to get information out as I'm sure you're all aware, it's not always the easiest thing at ISU. So if if any of you are interested in this information, we can certainly share it with you. And if you have thoughts on, oh, I'd, I'd love to see this graphic for every year, whatever, send it our way and we can see how we can make that a part of the web page or you know, bring it out in another fashion. Great. I don't see any other questions. Do you see any other questions yet, Jenny? Are you getting anything? Um, I don't. I didn't know if you wanted to do another call out for specific feedback or if you want to give people a second to weigh in, whatever you think. If anybody has thoughts, again, totally looking for any ideas. I know that as we've talked to various groups across campus, so uh, we have, I've talked with the, Dave Rogers and I have talked with the Dean's Council. We have talked to Research Council. We've talked to a variety of researchers, just ad hoc. Um, and I am more than happy to have discussions with any of you. Um, but if you have thoughts on, you know, what we can do to help. I've gotten suggestions about, you know, increasing grant writing help. Um, we've gotten questions or suggestions with, you know, looking more specifically at where those internal grants go and if we need to designate them towards certain areas to create synergy among people. So we've gotten a variety of ideas, but really the more ideas we get, the more creative thinking we can do and it, it, we think it will move us forward in the long run. So any, seriously, any thoughts you all have, send them email, call me up, we can set up a time to meet, put them in the chats now, all great. Okay, Donna, we have a couple more questions um, while people are thinking about that feedback. Um, the first question is for you, what is your plan for ISU overall indirect plan? That's a great question. So I can tell you that right now we're sitting at the wait and see point for understanding where we're going to be with the federal negotiations because obviously depending on what our federal rates are that impacts the amount of money we get at isu and there are certain things that we we have to do like pay our grants and contracts people so there are certain um set budget items that it you know 
the percentage of FNA that will go to that is going to vary just depending on how much FNA we get. So there is, there are some things that we have to address, but then looking at the rest of the numbers, um, we don't have a set idea. I know that we have toyed with doing things such as giving some money directly to PIs. That's been brought up as a possibility. Um, taking money out of some pots, and it hasn't been clear exactly which pots, but and doing things like hire a grant writer or share grant writers where Office for Research pays for part of it and a college pays for part of it. So there are a lot of ideas out there. And honestly, we do not have a set idea right now. I do believe that we need to maintain our percentage that goes to the library. I think a lot of people utilize the library, particularly the online access right now with COVID. So most individuals that we've talked to have still supported giving that chunk to the library. The deans and the colleges, of course, want to maintain their 30%, mostly because they're, they're able to do things like startups, um, travel, that type of thing with that piece of money. So I know that they're committed to having that. But right now, other than the things that have to be paid, like the salaries, um, you know, we're willing to look at a whole variety of ideas. So that gives you a very fuzzy answer to the question. Um, as we get more information from the federal negotiations, we will certainly update everyone and have a little more solid foundation to build our ideas from. But if you all have thoughts on where you think that should go, let us know. We're open to, to toying with those ideas. One thing to keep in mind with regards to the uh, the negotiations with the federal government and the FNA rates um, would be that we need to keep in mind that <clears throat> it's a it's a marathon, not necessarily a sprint with those negotiations. And so we work with a consulting firm to put together all sorts of information that affect our rates. That could be the amount of research space that we had in that we have in this rate negotiation versus last year, last time that we negotiated. Um, the amount of in, indirects or overhead that we recovered, the amount of indirects or overhead that we waived or that we should have gotten that we didn't that we didn't capitalize on. And so all of those things factor in. And then once we give our proposal to the federal government, they're indicating that because of everything, you, we are at a 12 to 18 month waiting period after after we get the, the proposal into the government. So it, we're going to be operating under our current rates for a while, but they could definitely change and most likely will change in one direction or the other. Donna, I have a couple more questions. Um, what is the Research Council doing and what part do they play in this process? So the Research Council is our connection to general faculty. So they have representatives from the various colleges and they talk about a whole variety of issues. They help with assessing distinguished researcher. They tackle some of the big questions we have. They look at internal grants. So who gets awarded the internal grants? So they do a lot of the um, connections between the faculty themselves and the things such as internal grants, distinguished researcher. Um, Trina Running, who is on this call, is heading up that committee this year and they're doing great stuff. Um, you know, I am more than willing, if, if there are specific questions with that, I am willing to address them. Um, maybe Trina would also be willing to, <laughs> if there's anything for her. Um, but really it is a very much of a connection and they've been giving us a lot of good feedback and insight and we're using them to, you know, hopefully build better connections and communication with the faculty at large. Did I answer all parts of that question? I will let you know if there are okay. follow-ups. <laughs> um, speaking of follow-ups, I have one on the indirect question. Uh, are you planning to have PIs get a certain percent to incentive PI writing grants rather than the deans keeping the indirect? So we have definitely talked about that as a possibility. It, you know, again, it's going to come down to 
what percentage of um, funds does ISU get through the FNA rates and then how we can distribute that. But if that is something that you all think would help incentivize you to do more grants, please send us an email that just says that. I, I'm making notes, so I've noted that down, but getting a feel for how broad the support is for that type of idea would be super helpful to us. So it is, it is on the list of possibilities. Thanks, Donna. Uh, next question. The Faculty Professional Policy Committee is currently working on updating the policy on intellectual property. Would it simulate research activities if the percent split was changed from the current 60-40 split to favor the inventor? And Jared and I have talked about this, so I want to throw that out to everybody else and get everybody else's opinions. Again, we recognize that we need to start making some shifts, so we're open to all of these ideas. So for everyone else on this call, um, what do you think about making that shift? So currently the way it's written, the university slash um, college slash program gets 60% and then the investigator gets the 40. Should we switch that percentages up? So it's 40, 60, 50, 50. Is there anything that would help incentivize intellectual property work? And again, if you all have thoughts on that, feel free to send us an email, or at isu.edu, um, and you know, throw it out there. We'll we'll take all of the information and see where we land. Donna, I have one comment on that that says 50-50 is better. It says 50-50 is better. Great. Yeah, and to give Jared credit here, he and I have talked about how you know, it, it takes a lot of time and energy on the PI's part, and they want to feel like this is, you know, a way that they get a benefit from all of their work. So we recognize that, and, you know, if, if there are ways that we can incentivize more intellectual property work, great, it's going to be a win-win for everybody. I have another comment on that point. Um, undergraduate research has good return on investment. In addition to State Board of Education funds, my suggestion is to look for new ways to increase opportunities for undergrad research and open it up for more students to participate. So I love that. I think that's great. And I can tell you that many of the meetings I've been in with the other institutions and then also State Board of Ed members have emphasized undergraduate research. The state legislature, the State Board of Ed is very tuned into how education is the key factor for institutions and research is a part of that, but they like that education link. And they see that very directly when we're talking about undergraduate research. They can see how an undergraduate working in a lab, that is a part of that educational experience. So they are very much um, pro this type of research activity. Because of that, we do see things like the HERC funding, the Higher Ed Research Committee out of the state gives some money specifically to undergrad research and also very supportive of things like the undergrad research um, talks that are coming up. So building on that, great idea. Um, I know that we have also had suggestions that graduate students need to be more incentivized when it comes to research. So I have noted both of those things. If there are ideas on how we can build on that, is it simply, you know, funding students to do research? Is it making, I don't know, certain things more accessible through the library so they have easier access to research? If you have any ideas on how to build in that research, that would be great. And Deb, I don't know if you have any additional comments on that. 
way, way back when I started at ISU, um, the Office for Research actually had a pool of money for graduate students and for undergraduate students. And then um, over the years and the vice presidents, that went away. But then the state board started funding undergraduates in STEM. But that's all we can fund out of undergraduate money is undergraduates in STEM disciplines. So I would love to see ISU contribute a portion to an undergraduate research program. And I think a lot of it is money, being able to get the students to work in the labs and do research and so that they can afford to not have to go get a job outside of campus. I have a related um, comment for that. It just says funds for researchers to, to hire students, which is exactly what it sounds like Deb is talking about. Um, and then another follow-up comment to this. Yes, anything that will give a percent of the NDREX back to the PIs for all the work and effort they do that goes into getting grants will encourage and incentivize them to write more grants. Right now, it's done different depending on the unit, um, unit in. It should be the same for all faculty across the university. And that is very true. The different colleges distribute their funds differently and some of them give funds directly to PIs where some of them don't. So doing it, having more of a uniform um, is definitely something I'm noting down. And while you're doing that, Donna, I think I think this next question might be for Fred. Um, is it still the case that ISU covers the expense of patent filing fees and maintenance fees? Yes. Although, uh, you know, that's not some blanket. We don't necessarily cover it for everybody who asks. I mean, we don't have a really um, airtight rule as to you know, when we might decide, you know what, we're, this this particular technology is great and wonderful, but you know, there's not a market, discernible market for it. So we're not gonna pursue that. We, we don't have a uh, airtight policy regarding that, but if um, we do choose to pursue a patent, then yes, we cover it. That's, I mentioned that we use, that's one of the uses of our um, indirect recovery that the Office for Research gets is paying those patent filings and maintenance fees. And just to add to that, we do have a, pro Fred's right, it's not airtight, but we do have a process we go through to look at what is the idea, how long have they been, you know, the person been working on this, is there a market? So there are a number of issues that we look at for each one in order to make those determinations. And we have a comment, um, a disagreement that it should be uniform back to the previous uh, statement. And there's always the possibility of doing a uniform minimum and then if colleges want to shift it from there. So I think there's a variety of ways we can look at this to still allow flexibility at the college or division level as well. Okay, thanks, Donna. We have um, kind of a question uh, clarification. I was trying to understand if the college 60% split goes to cover the fees. Okay, a follow up on that. The, the fees for the patent? So yes, I think this goes back to the question for Fred, which is, is it still the case that ISU covers the expense of patents, filing fees, and maintenance fees? And then the clarification is, I was trying to understand if the college 60% split goes to cover the fees patent. So usually that 60-40% is when it's the intellectual property, so it's that phase after the patent. So the patent comes before that. Um, as a way to then build it for the market. And that 60-40 split is more looking at when you actually have something that is being put out um, into the marketplace. Does that clarify that question? So it's, it's, 
there's two steps to that process. I mean, there's actually multiple steps to that process, but those are two different phases and the patent fees come prior to the intellectual property um, split. Sounds like that does answer it. Thanks, Donna. Um, another suggestion back uh, to the PIs, all deans and directors should put on research website what they give back to PIs. Right now it's all word of mouth. And a clarification that what they give back means indirect. So I'll read that one more time. All deans and directors should put on the research website uh, what they give back, meaning indirect, to PIs. Right now it's all word of mouth. I'm making a note of that. That's a little tough. I'll just comment on that because, you know, I can only speak to my college, you know, in the College of Science and Engineering, but in, in the College of Science and Engineering, the dean uses um, a, a big chunk, about half, not quite half, but approximately half of what the college gets back, he gives to the departments as research, you know, block grants. So the 30% comes to the Dean. There's not an automatic sort of where you would say, oh, I'm automatically redistributing such and such percentage back down. But, you know, it, it does get distributed back to the departments who then have their own methodology for how they award that to individual PIs. So it is going to be a lot harder to provide that kind of reporting than you might think, because I'm guessing what most of the deans would say is, well, that percentage that we give back, we give almost all of that or some gigantic percentage of that back to the researchers. It's just given back instead of as this direct line channel, it's given back via these various um, you know, mechanisms that they use to support research in their colleges. So that kind of reporting is gonna be harder to put together than it really seems when you first think about it, that it might be. Um, okay, so follow up on that, Fred. That's okay. However, when they win, then uh, they say the 30% goes to the department and then tell what the department chair does or if the chair keeps it. That's what the problem is. Just tell the dean chair, et cetera. Okay, and we have um, another suggestion. Um, having local accounts such that we can see how much we have brought in in indirect and have to spend would be useful. Similarly, being able to easily see how much has been spent on an account would also be helpful. And I completely yeah. understand that it's when researchers creative activities are you know if you're charging funds out it's always good to know what your closest dollar amount is so i've also made a note of that hey that's all i see on my end donna um we are actually getting pretty close to the hour that was fast um i will turn it back over to you for any closing thoughts thank you Great. thanks jenny so again, thanks everybody for being a part of this. This is a discussion that is just starting. We're going to be collecting ideas and thoughts for a while. I'm hoping that, you know, I can, we, the Office of Research can set kind of a deadline for first rounds of ideas so that we can start working on some of these. Um, but of course, this is something that's just going to be ongoing for quite some time, particularly given the information you that you were provided on how FNA rates and we're negotiating with the feds and all of those pieces that, that Dave Harris was talking about. So it's going to be, you know, ongoing for a while, but by all means, please do send us any thoughts you have. We want to 
make the future of research and creative activities at ISU more expansive, more friendly to the researchers and the folks doing the creative activities. So anything that we can do to start addressing some of the obstacles or looking at some of the incentives that we could provide, we are more than happy to have those ideas and see what we can do with them. So again, if you have thoughts, send them to or at isu.edu. And uh, we look forward to all the creative ideas you all come up with. So thank you. And if you have questions, always feel free to reach out to the Office for Research.